All right, great. All right, so I'm going to talk about the um, client static analyzer with uh, respect to the Linux kernel for a little bit. First off, uh, who am I? I'm an undergraduate student at uh, Villanova University. And I applied for this summer's GSOC with um, the Linux Foundation. And um, BN and um, Jan Simon have been my mentors. And all right, let's get started. Sort of very, like on a very basic level. Like why, why even bother with this, right? Well, development time is, a, is a expensive. I mean, you all know that. And the idea is to just find all kinds of errors that usually you wouldn't catch as you compile your code at compile time. So you, I mean, there are certain things you, I mean, there's tons of things you can just find simply by parsing through the code, but certain types of errors just require semantic analysis, which is why you have static analyzers. So, and it, a lot of things related to null pointers. A lot of like um, argument uh, or parameter passing that has certain attributes. Like uh, when you know, when you're passing a null parameter to a function that definitely, that you already know expects a non-null value. All these kind of things that you, that you kind of know, but the compiler cannot know, at least not on the parsing level, is what you want the uh, analyzer to learn so that the mistake you once make will not happen again. Well, it sounds great, but like, what is, what is the downside to, to it? Well, the compile time. So on my machine, uh, not this one, but uh, a laptop of uh, quad-core I was using, compiling x86 took about five hours, meaning with all the analysis. Well, the compiling still takes whatever short amount it does, but then again, you have um, the analyzer goes through all, not all possible, but like a, uh, the equivalent of all possible paths for your program, and that's going to be expensive especially with something as big as the kernel, right? So that's one negative. The uh, 4,500 uh, issues, that was when I first started. That was the very first thing I did. Figured, like, well, what happens if you run it with the default values, like the default uh, selection of checkers and everything? Well, 4,500 issues came up. About half of them, uh, or not half, maybe like a third of them, were unused, unused variables. So what, what does it end up being? Well, it's some kind of like macro expansion where you have, where you get a return value equals something and that's the last thing in the function before it returns. Uh, or it doesn't even like return if it's a void. So that was a big source. Another one was, um, well, I'll start with the bottom one, something like uninitialized variables. So uninitialized var really expands to, I don't know, you would have something like int x equals x which was, as far as I understand, basically done to silence GCC's warnings on those kind of issues. Well, it doesn't work for Clang quite the same way, so that was a huge, uh, huge problem. And um, this is something that also does need to be worked on because I'm sure there's, there, there might be some instances where this could have actual real implications that we are simply not seeing by having this turned off. Another problem is the lack of interprocedural analysis. Well, it's not, uh, I'm just referring to this inter procedure analysis. It's really inter, I guess, like object file basis. So you know, so if, if, if you know some uh, function is, is calling something that is not known at, um, at compile time, the analyzer cannot see that, that path that it would go down and it expects for that specific function to be called with all kinds of inputs. And so it will, give you, it give, will give you an error or a message for things that would never really happen in the code, but it can't know that because it's just, it is, it is a hard problem to solve in the first, uh, well, first of all, and second, just imagine the size of the graph or like the, 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 yeah, the tree that it would take to have actually all of the code be expanded and then uh, visited through. So those, um, those are the main issues. But I, I feel like the um, lack, like the interview procedure analysis is going to happen eventually. Like, um, to be Bruce, clear, though, Bruce was mentioning that. To be clear, though, you, it does inter procedural analysis within the object file, just not without. No, within, within everything works. I yes. Just to point that out. Right. 
no, 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 just want to make that like clear. Between yes, object between files. object files at, right. after link time. That's right. Right. Okay, this is an interesting one. So sparse is a, I mean, you'll probably know about it, is another tool that is used to find uh, similar types of issues. And, well, why not sparse? Well, I, I dug up this little um, piece of info from the uh, frequently asked questions. And I think it illustrates the point pretty nicely. Because it's all talking about how GCC is basically not usable for it, because it's one big monolithic block and licensing issues, I guess. So the great part is, well, Clang is, is, uh, is well, LLVM slash Clang is built as one toolbox, right? So you have, you have the front end, and you, it produces, and you get your, I don't know, syntax tree in that, and you have, like, later on some intermediate representation, but you're really, you're really independent in that regard. You have, you have the tree, and you can easily access it. It's possible to easily write just plugins for Clang, and, well, I, I'm not an expert in licensing, but if I remember, if I remember right, the Clang LLVM stuff is uh, BSD. So even if, 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 you, if someone would decide to do something commercially, that shouldn't be a, a problem if I understand this right. And all this analysis is just decoupled, or not completely, but like once you, you just have the tree, and it understands everything, right? Everything that, can, that Clang possibly understands is contained in there. So you don't need to write your own parsers, you don't need to write your own, well, anything really. It's already there. So it'd be a waste uh, not to use it. With, with all the implications that it may have. So it, it just gives uh, bigger opportunities or like a greater, uh, has greater potential. Well, how to actually um, get this working? Which, is, well, which was the issue I was facing when I started off. Well, luckily the little, uh, well, there was some kind of infrastructure already in place from Sparse, which was basically the check and uh, check flags. So those could be utilized to run the analyzer in the, let's say, in the simple mode of just like on a file by file basis. So it would show up in your compile output, no different than like a warning or uh, something similar. But the great, uh, the great thing about it, um, about the whole analyzer, is the scan build tool. I don't know uh, how many. How many have actually seen scan build output? All right, that's great because I'll show that some in a second. Um, so basically, what the tool does, it 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 knows, it 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 takes all this warning and creates a path. It will be like your source will be like an HTML file, and that creates actually a clickable path through to see exactly what uh, branches were taken, what values were assumed to get to the point where it is. Also, great thing if you like hover over a macro, it expands in like a pop-up, and that makes it really easy to find issues. Um, a little problem was that uh, the way, for example, the extended the uh, GCC assembler extension works. The way it is detected is just by well trying it on a file, which is the problem that which the problem that implies is that scan build cannot be used in its default mode, which is, which is a check with Clang but compile with GCC, because the compile will obviously work, because it's just GCC. But um, because of that, the variables are set in, in a way that the analyzer will keep on failing, because it, can't, it, can't, it will actually uh, choke on the, on the ASM, uh, ASM syntax. So, all right. Great. All right, so um, what you're seeing here is the listing of some of the, the runs on, uh, on our build bot from LLVM Linux. Let's look, let's look at one of the um, later ones. So this is an example output of the, of the tool. So in this case, we are building the, uh, an ARN type target. And after, after all the tuning, oh yeah, I was, let me just uh, mention that real quick. So you see all these bug types, this is like the different individual checks um, the Clang Analyzer can do. 
The problem with the analyzer right now for the purpose of the Linux kernel is it has tons of checks and even more like in alpha stages that aren't even enabled by default, but very few of them are actually applicable. Like if I, if I just go down the list real quick, I mean there's, there's, like, there's like clear ones like null the reference, divide by zero, um, zero length uh, or undefined VLAs. But then there's about like 20 checks that aren't usable because they're specific to OS X. Then there's some security ones that, ch that check, I don't know, um, get, gets, make temp, that kind of stuff. So that's not applicable either. And then there's some Unix API ones which are really iffy because, for example, the, the well, I don't know, for example, printf and that kind of syntax is, is very misleading. If some, if some functions in the kernel have actually the same name as they would have in glibc. So a lot of these aren't actually uh, usable. So that's, that's how it got from four and a half thousand. Well, that was on x86, so that might be slightly different. But from like over 2,000 at least to the, down to 100 right now. Well, what is the problem? Uh, I mean, like, are these real bugs? This is basically going to be the question. Well, let's look at them, at some of them at least. Um, is there, let's see, if I decrease the size, it might be. You, see, you also see like a path length on the side. Like let's take, a, let's take a really short one and you will be able to see what the actual issue is. Well, right here, for example. Well, about that, right? Why, is this, is this, is this a real problem? If you, if you don't know anything, if you just look at the code, yeah, I mean, like, why, why wouldn't this happen, right? But this is, this is an issue that is, that is a bit hard for the um, static analyzer to decide, which is why it, why it, uh, why it uh, is looking at, or as, assuming the null. Well, I don't know. It's a, so we've seen similar problems, and uh, one of the ways to fix it is to add, to make the function that's called on one-on-one's macro to be a no attribute no return, if it does assert. Okay, that, that's the thing, I, that's what I want to do, to get, get. Exactly, so it should assert and it should be a, a no return function. No, but I'm saying, this, is, this was just a, this was actually a randomly picked example right now. Um, might not illustrate the point quite as well, because this, this run happened, I think, this morning, and I, I actually haven't checked it. I was just, just like looking for the ones with the shortest uh, path, so it's easier to see. Well, I don't know, let's look at this one. Is this also a one on ones one? Well, there you have it. God damn it. Where did it go? Let's try again. Yes. Well, there you have a similar issue, right? It's, the, it's, it's these kind of macros. To just throw it off, and and then you have like all these null pointer references that aren't really real, and these are like the issues that this has to fight with. This, I mean, I I I use it for the analyzer for like my personal projects, whatever. <laughs> all this like you, this is it's made for user space. Like this is what it was designed. I mean, not not like infrastructurally, but this was the use case. And by seeing, looking at all these reports, this is kind of clear because it's never technically entirely wrong. I mean, like, look right here. Come on. Well, oh, this is okay. I guess this is also hard to show this with these kind of expansions. Try looking at one of the longer ones, maybe. Yeah. So. Well, this is like Unix APIs examples. Uh, I don't even know if they're worth really showing. Yeah. Uh, just to, out of curiosity, did it catch? I think sysrq.c has a forced dereference of a null. It's dev tty sysrq. Sysrq? I think yeah, I'm almost positive that was a forced dev uh, null dereference. There you go. This one? <laughs> 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 
Well, I guess. So, well, the point is these are the kind of issues that this is really facing, that we're really facing with this. Because I can definitely see how, just one sec, how these checks are working, but applied to the kernel, it, so, so you I need think, new ones. I think you don't have any chance to fix it all yourself. I think that you need a way to get the information to the people who are writing the code, yeah? yeah. So, for example, if you have the build board already running, find some way if somebody checks in something new, send them an email when there's a new one. Oh, no, no, that is definitely yeah. the goal. What the goal yeah. is, first of all, the goal is to set it up in such a way that you don't have to go through each and every item and there's, a, I don't know, a 50, 80, whatever percent chance that you're just wasting your time, right? Goes to have a, set of, a system set up so that the, there's a, so that the trade-off between time in investigating this bug and actually it being a real thing makes it worth it. The other thing I should point out too is this is a little bit like sparse. This is something that anybody can run on their own machine uh, with Clang and ScanBuild uh, before they ever submit a patch, right? You write your software, you run ScanBuild on it, uh, the, the Clang Static Analyzer through ScanBuild, you look to see whether any new problems have, have happened and, and uh, from that then you can then figure out whether you've made it better or worse or whatever. The idea isn't just to have a centralized system like this that then generates bug reports. The, the, the idea is to put these uh, tools into developers' hands so they have a better way of not introducing problems in the first place and then potentially also for um, somebody to run on to actually find problems that they can then submit patches for themselves. You know, Kernel newbies kinds of kinds of projects as well. The, not, not everyone will. Yeah, no, not everyone will. But but the other thing too is is if you look right now, Edwards. Perhaps, yes. Well, but again, it's to get it out to people so they can see it themselves, yeah. But right now we're looking at simple, simple uh, runs just because they, they're easier to look at on the screen. It's the ones that are like 50 steps long that are the most interesting because then you actually see this long and tortured yeah. path through a whole bunch of different functions that you never would have seen on your own, right? That it's actually figured out on its, itself. But the problem is you really have to sit down really read the, the code and really follow its logic all the way through and say, you know, if this is null, then blah, 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 blah. And it'll take you through each one of those like steps. Here. Like, look at this one, right? It's like, this it's is, like Street View. This is 58 steps. Yeah. So going through this, I, I don't know how reasonable this is, right? I mean, it's, it's nice, like all, you, you can click back and forth. You're jumping. I don't know if you look at the scroll bar. You're jumping from function to function, whatever. But going through all this, I can see why people aren't like thrilled about it. Let's, let's put it like this. And this is, this is like the state that is in like by default. So the goal is really to do, um, to basically have a kernel version of many of these checks that just is different in, in such a way that you can, uh, that is different in such a way that it accounts for the differences in just, in just style and like basic assumptions that you have in your, when, you're, when you're writing code for the kernel as opposed to like writing code for user land or writing code to be like co completely correct or completely compliant with the standards. So, yeah. Those are just a few examples. I mean like, I guess like the, if, if, if you unlike any of these, the takeaway is Look how nice you can actually browse through this and uh, find errors. Like I actually made, um, I don't know, put, did I put it on the slide? No. Um, one of the checkers I made, I can show, let's see. So Edward, a quick comment on, on this discussion yeah. is, uh, we face the same problems uh, in Qualcomm in trying to get people to use this. Now, a couple of things that we've tried is one is we have actually taken out a lot of checkers and specifically for something like this to work, the false positives must be really low. And we've traded off true positives for that. You, I think you have to do that. I definitely um, agree. And then the other thing is, is goes to the, the use model, right? I don't expect that people will run this on existing code and look at 1,000 uh, errors and they'll go through all of them. What I really expect is a developer 
compiling, you know, changing code in one file, compiling that with the static analyzer, and immediately getting feedback about the new snippet of code that that person has introduced and said, hey, there might be a problem here. That's the use model that I see at least in Qualcomm work. I agree. I mean, like the ideal case, right, if, uh, which is not, not like in magic land, but like that's something that someone can come up with, right? So let's say you have, you have like some kind of like compiling build system that actually keeps state for you personally about um, specific like checks, right? So let, okay, you create some file. You run the analyzer on it, it finds like 10 issues. You, this is, well, you created this code, so any of those could potentially be real. So you go through all of them, and then you say, like, um, and then you have, like, a checkbox next to each, and that says ignore. And once you ignore this, it remembers the exact, it remembers the exact subgraph that caused uh, the, for, for this to occur, and just ignores it in the future, right? Doing that, you, you wouldn't even require any changes. You could use it the way it is. I mean, right now, you, you're still missing a lot of real issues, and, you're, and you're, you're reporting a lot of wrong ones. But that would like already tune down the annoyance factor. But, this, but at the same time, I mean, like, this, is, this, is, this, is like a, this is something that people would do, but this isn't really solving the issue of, uh, of, of all these um, false uh, positives. Um, like, I created a checker. I don't, I don't know if I can call it up right here, but I'll uh, explain in the meantime. Uh, basically, basically, when you clear, declare functions with um, a double underscore in it, so you give a, so, you, so they get into um, um, what is it? Dot, uh, in it the text. This um, the, this checker actually goes goes through the, for, for your code and checks that you're not calling any of these functions outside of, uh, that you're not calling any init functions or accessing any init data variables outside of init functions. And I had, I had a run of that and I had it captured. I don't know if it's, um, pull it up in a second. Just give me one second. Essentially it's looking for section mismatches to do with init code. All right, so, um, okay, I was kind of cheating with this one because I couldn't find anything in time, any real case. So I just took a random file and modified it to see if it would work. So in, so in here, because um, it wasn't giving me any output up until then, and I figured, like, well, I got to show something, right? So in here, in here, you're, in here this uh, function mp underscore io apic info is called. So you follow back the path, and then you realize um, that while that one is an init function, which, you, OK, you don't see it through the path, the function calling it isn't. In the kernel, it is. I just, I just removed it just to like prove the point. No, uh, not necessarily, because the thing is, well, it, 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 it might work in the GCC case. But what happens is with Clang, not section attributes don't always propagate. It depends, it depends on where you actually put them. So what, does, what ends up happening is it goes through the AST and sees if they're actually like valid in there. I don't, I don't know, how does, how does a mod post uh, do that? Well. Oh, um, no, actually, well, I was, we were trying to look that up, whether, how, how it is according to the standard. Well, well actually, to be, to be entirely fair, the, this actually goes back to a, a um, discussion that was actually on LKML recently. It's a matter of do we put uh, attributes onto symbols or onto types. And what it comes down to is um, most, in most places, people have actually done it incorrectly, and they've actually put the uh, attribute onto the type as do onto the, the, um, the symbol itself unfortunately, and what it comes down to is uh, essentially Clang does it the way it's written for GCC, which is you're supposed to deal with it on, a, on the, um, the symbol, not on the type. So what it comes down to is GCC works by accident. It's really not supposed to work. 
Okay, okay, fair enough. My, my whole point is, is, is that if all the attributes were ass, uh, assigned to the, the symbols themselves, it would work properly. I mean, the and way that... With both compilers. Clang would do, would do it the right way, uh, and GCC would do it the right way. The problem is, is that the... But, 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 Well, we found, okay, the, the, what triggered it was we found a, a bug on the, that was reported on the mailing list, on the LKML, uh, where that didn't happen. But you have, if you want a full listing, you have to enable a config option that not all of them, that all of them, that if you run the dumb thing, dumb bad references, you have to enable okay. a config option. I, I wasn't aware of that, and the, the whole thread, no one, no one mentioned that, so I didn't even know of the, of the option. The all right. This is a proof of concept, too. This is showing what you can do if you're looking at the AST parse tree. You, you can actually put in actual rules that are specific to the kernel that, um, that encode things that you don't want to have to happen in, in the case of the kernel. You're basically teaching the compiler better rules that have to do specifically with the, with the kernel code as opposed to some other code. Well, and at the same time, it's, it's, it's one of the questions where you want to do this, right? Do you want to have a, external tools? Or, I mean, in this case, you already, you already have a perfect representation of all the code, right? If you can it right there and then. Sorry, I think there's a lot of cool use cases for that. I'm not suspicious on that in it. All right. Case, but, but as, as, long, as, as long as you believe that there's many um, good cases, I'm happy. So, so, for example, I think one thing that, that I would find really, but I would like to see what one thing that really annoys me when I work on current code is, um, the kernel has, has, um, uses this manual C object model where you declare your own V tables essentially. Mm -hmm. And if you ever want to find everybody, everybody who goes through, through the one um, method, it's really nasty. You have to grab it and look for everyone who has assigned it and so on. So one thing, for example, I would really see when you have a complete ASC, just walk everyone who assigns this type and that function, and then gonna gives me a class browser type thing, like yeah. you have in C++. That's, that's one thing, for example, that, that I would really love to have, it's like a C-scope-like thing, where you just can follow to class browsing, but it, it works with those manual. Yeah, open. I mean, like, there's, like that. I mean, class browsing, all that kind of, I mean, there's a, there's an extension I use, for example, for, for Win that actually uses Clang to create, like, the complete, like, the, that does all the auto-completion, so. <coughs> There's, there's like tons of things you can do. Yeah, obviously more, more work has to be done here. The, the whole point is, is that we can turn off a lot of the checkers that don't make space because they're meant primarily for user space. Uh, we can then potentially add specific kernel uh, related rules or checkers rather to, to uh, the static analyzer which then through scan build, build those, um, those nice uh, HTML uh, annotated source code files that show you where the problem is and, and, and uh, how many of them are and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah. Um, one, one very interesting case I encountered was actually um, I was trying to, to run the analyzer on the whole, on all of um, x86 and during one of the creation of the object files, what would happen is it would constantly just uh, run out of memory. It was, in my case it was four gigs, but I tried on a 16 gig machine, same issue. So it would, it would, just, it would just not work. And after like some, some um, reducing the original, uh, I forgot, like 7,000 lines to this, does it, can anyone guess what, 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 what was it that caused um, the analyzer to just die? <laughs> this is not a dumb I mean, it's, it's in the right direction, but. <laughs> Yeah, it was really the range right here. It was not the range of the entire table, but it was just the statement 32 to um, that value minus one. So yeah, I mean, we filed a bug about that. But it was just this, this part. It was until we found it with using, what was it, delta? That took a while because my way of checking was out of memory killer kills the, kills the process. So yeah. that took a while. Stopped by um killer. So, oh, I figured, oh, yeah, you can, you can just, uh, in the shell, just uh, change the maximum memory it can use. Yeah, but then, then malloc returns uh, zero, and that doesn't cause it to happen. <laughs> All right, so how would you, how would you actually, like, extend, extend this whole thing and make uh, better checkers out of everything? 
Well, I mean, how, how does, how does uh, Sparse do some of its things, right? It creates, it creates attributes like the uh, user attribute or some others. Well, no, I mean the user, the user macro which expands to the uh, no, what was it, no DREF and address space one attributes. Um, it's actually really easy to implement these, as it turns out. Um, really, there's just one file. So there was no, there was no, no DREF in uh, Clang originally. It was, it was just these three lines. And then you would have to just write uh, one more entry in a case. And, um, and, and just the, the function to handle it, which, which, which would be like, I don't know, 20 lines of code. And you already can add an attribute that way. And I mean, as long as you discard them, after, like, after putting them in a tree, working through them, having the analyzer evaluate them, you're not really losing anything that way. So that would be one approach to deal, to deal with many of these issues, like, like just these implicit assumptions that are made. Like this function will never be called with a null value, but there's nothing written that says that this is actually the case. But you know from just the architecture of the system that this will never happen. So that would be like uh, one example of this. And well, the real big question is like, there's so much you can do, and well, what is it? What is it? What is it that uh, that you would do? What is it that you? What would it be? What you guys want to see? Because you can just just about anything can be done, really. Just while I'm walking over there quickly, um, to add a slightly different question: How exactly do you run scan build on the kernel? Um, in this case, it was uh, tied in with the build system uh, that we have from LLVM Linux. But in principle, it's I mean, you, you need a few modifications if you do it this way, but in principle, it's something like scan build, like in, in the Linux uh, source directory, scan build, make. Scan build just sets the, sets the environmental variables like CC and so on, right, to like its own wrapper, and that, and, and that just ensures that every file is checked and every file is also compiled. By default, it compiles with GCC which was why that issue was encountered that I was showing earlier. Uh, for my part, uh, I mean, I've been trying to play a little bit with, well, creating uh, uh, analysis, custom analysis, and see how these things work. Uh, one thing I figured is that, I mean, besides a couple of blog posts that you have to dig through the internet to kind of figure out how to get your compiler tool, uh, chain built and working on your machines, I mean, uh, some documentation would be really useful in that regard. I agree. The second thing is the plugins that you do, the shared objects, are actually C++ shared objects, and they have to be built pretty much with the same compiler that built your compiler. And, I mean, having a clear interface, maybe a C <laughs> interface between the plugins and the compiler might be quite useful. Um, the other thing I've noticed, so I work with other people who are, well, more using, well, they're kind of forced to use Windows stuff, right? And, uh, but they are, they are great compiler guys. And, uh, but it happens that it seems to be very, uh, I think it's, well, elf-centric. Uh, so the plugins basically require a, a global symbol table in, uh, uh, in whatever environment you run, run it in. So that basically the, cons well, basically the plugins that are loaded never register on Windows. I see. So we, uh, we had to figure it out. It worked fine on Linux, but then, well, on Windows oh. doesn't work. So, I mean, as, as, as soon as those problems are going to be hashed out, I think a lot more contributors are going to start contributing small uh, custom uh, analysis because, I mean, the, the internal representation is nice and everything, so I think uh, just small things are needed to get there. Well, um, as far as I understand, Clang and Windows in itself is like a work in progress. So, so I, I believe that some of those issues at least could be, would be uh, figured out in the process of getting that to work. But um, the C interface, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, C interface, probably never going to happen. Right. Um, there's a C interface to libclang 
Um, I just don't know that you could write an analyzer pass without using the, um, the, some of those C++ data structures. Um, I don't think that it's at all true that, that it's not possible for the plugin system to work on Windows. I work with, at my job, um, I, we have a plugin system that was designed primarily on Windows and works in both Windows and Linux that uses the same um, loading mechanisms uh, that are used in Clang. So I'm fairly certain that there's no reason whatsoever that that should not work. Um, I mean, I, I can take a look into that, but if, if you'd like to try to get whoever those people are who are having trouble with that in contact with me. Um, I think that was, oh, and the other thing is that the Clang on Windows, there, I've heard that now there is basically a drop-in replacement for um, the Microsoft compiler for Windows. So the situation there is pretty good. That was a recent thing, right? Um, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, recent. All right, fair enough. Personally, I'd, I'd like to see some checkers that, that check for some of the common, um, albeit simpler, issues that the real-time preemptible patch team have been finding. But I'm not sure how those could be implemented exactly. It just seems like a lot of stuff keeps on coming up over and over again. I've certainly heard Tomas uh, complain lots that he fixes everything and then it gets screwed up by the next set of patches and so on. Just, just give me one second to respond to the um, C interface for the, for, the, for the checkers. Well, the way, you, the way you write the checkers, it seems to me, I mean, I haven't done much conversion back and forth, I have to say, but it seems to me very uh, C++ heavy. There's a, like, a lot of template magic going on. Like the way you register for callbacks and all that, I don't... I don't know if you if you if you could map that to C, like specific for the checkers that is. I I don't I don't know about the rest of the interface. Um, so, I'm just thinking in terms of uh, specific things I check for when I'm code reviewing, and <clears throat> so things like undocumented magic numbers on M weights, you know, or you know, it's like, or, or other magic numbers that aren't documented. I'd like to. That's Something like that. Well, what do you what do you mean by documentation? Like comments? Uh, yeah, basically a comment. Well, the but problem is you don't see that at the AST yeah, level. Yeah, I didn't think you'd be able to do that. The other things that we'd be looking for were, were, were things like um, unusually large numbers in, in used in certain APIs, you know, like delay APIs, you know, um, thing uh, error paths that don't don't free up memory. If you allocate memory in a function, you're going into an error path. You know, do I have a memory leak? Well, uh, there, there, there are checks for memory leaks. There you got that, okay. Um, things like um, if I grab a spin lock or a lock in a function and I don't release it on the way out, I'd like to get a and warning like at least. It's not necessarily an error, but I'd want it to be flagged and something to look at. Those in user space, but it's a matter of porting those to kernel space, but absolutely. Those are all good yeah. examples. Yeah, okay. So, um, in the talk I gave last year at Linux? Yeah, um, at LinuxCon, um, yeah, there. Um, I, I showed some very, very crude um, checkers that I had modified for kernel stuff, one of which was a lock checker um, that was relatively simple. Um, I think on that same thread, is Paul in the room? guy who uh, gave the talk on the doing verification of the SMP code in no, the kernel. He is not here. So, so he showed some examples of doing some programs that were doing some, uh, some SAT, solving some SAT problems um, to verify, uh, you know, small portions of code. So if you wanted to um, create and solve a SAT problem for large portions of the kernel code, I think the way you would do it would be to use Clang. Um, because I just don't think there's any other tool that's going to give you um, as easy access to the AST structure to be able to, to build something like, a, like verification routines. Um, I think, you know, I, another example I showed in that talk uh, last year was, was, you know, doing stuff with malloc and free and that's easy to modify for kernel allocation routines. Um, I, I think that it's got a lot of potential for 
concurrency problems because I think that most of the place, for most of these warnings or errors, um, you know, there's a lot of work going into, into reducing false positives. Um, obviously, when you have concurrency problems, those are much, much harder to find, and it's generally worth, you know, some additional investment of time to try to track those down. So, that's my 10 cents. Anybody else? Okay. Well, do, doing all this stuff doesn't help a lot unless we actually get bug reports. Well, it's true. But, like I was saying, uh, the goal is to get to a state where, where it where it's becomes worth it going through all these results to actually go for bug reports. Because, I mean, in principle, once, once we have all that, uh, that would be, I mean, the, you could even am implement it in such a way that whenever you get one of those, one of those reports that you, <laughs> that you automatically get like a pre-formatted like patch. Or not patch, but like email with, with the exact result. Yeah, you couldn't necessarily automate the patch. No, uh, my, my bad. Yeah. yeah well, it depends, it. right? I mean, like, so for, for really trivial things that, that, the, that Clang does suggest, but that wouldn't be so much caught by the analyzer. That would be more something on the, on the parser level. The, the other thing that, that I would like to see out of something like this is what you were talking about, um, not really having yet, which is the interfile uh, processing, because that's something that, you, as a reviewer, you flip from one file to another, you probably forget a lot of the stuff that you just saw. Um, so having the computer, which presumably doesn't have that problem if, if you uh, extend it enough, that would be, that would probably catch a lot of really obscure problems. That's yeah, I know. It's, 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 this is, it's a computational it's, problem. It's common to any kind of incremental compilation system, but still... That would have to be added to the yeah. client, right? Yes, <laughs> right. Now that's also like a big, like this whole inter, well, object, I guess, and that's just a computational issue, right? I mean... Yeah, every path through every <laughs> object. Through everything. Yeah. It's huge, yeah. Not, not impossible, but not, not possible soon. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. No. Oh. Uh, so the example of where a stack address was being written uh, in global variables, I think you have a real bug there. Uh, Do you want to pull it up? Yeah, if you want. So it seems to be, uh, so we are adding an element into a list, and so the entry is on the stack. It's added onto the list, and it's really unclear whether it's at all removed before the end of the function, and this is actually what the, so, so just show the, uh, yeah, stack address stored in global variable, right we just there. have one. So basically, we have a list head on the stack, so we have now our node. We're adding it into a global list. Then we kind of exit, so we have a corrupted list. So if we ever have another list added into that list, we are going to write onto a random stack address somewhere. So it might not be so good. I see. Yeah, the, the, uh, and the up free list does not do a safe iteration on the list, too. I mean, there were, there's a couple of things that seems to be quite weird in that area of code. Yeah, a... well, we, we should look at it, but, well, I don't know. I think it's, uh, it's a for each, but not safe. It's, no, uh, it's kind of weird. So... Probably worth being investigated in any case, yeah. I'm, s I'm sorry? <laughs> Somebody should look at it in any case. Okay, cool. All right, well, yeah, essentially, essentially that this is a proof of concept. This shows you what is possible with Static Analyzer, um, the kind of tool that would be in every developer's hands if indeed um, we had the ability to, to build Clang. We also get the ability sorry, to build the kernel with Clang, we also get the ability to use scan build at the same time, and these are the kinds of 
information that could be made available to every kernel developer or a person who's trying to put a patch in uh, before they even submit a patch or indeed from a centralized, uh, if anybody wanted to start a centralized service to, in order to uh, actually look for problems and, uh, and send things along. So, And creating checkers, new checkers for uh, specifically for the kernel. Uh, of course, the idea is we don't want any false positives. So I think that the first step, what you should do is to get this, this two-liner you had at the beginning that, that it sets the right minus D flag that you can just run it. Um, if you submit a patch and so that everybody can run it. For which, sorry? So yeah, at the beginning you had, you had this small change of the sparse check which you adopted to, to make it work, yeah? It's, if, I think there was a kernel patch, right? Oh, the init one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you, I think that's the first step, you should try to get this included into the main kernel so everybody can run it. So they don't need to patch that. So, sorry, can you say that again? You should get that part to make it actually work without patching the kernel, include it, include the, the make file. The okay. Yeah. No. Because otherwise you always have to change it and that's the first barrier. Okay. That's true. Any other questions or, or comments? Uh, yes. Is the code code's in there now, right? Yeah, because yes. it gets run on the yeah. It's a matter of like to from zero to seeing this. It's it's literally a matter of cloning the repository, changing directory into the right target. So in this case, it would be a CD. Um, targets v express and a make kernel scan build yeah and then in, at the very end of your output you will have um, it's a use scan view which is like a wrapper to call your browser with the right directory and you will get the start page where you had like all the check bar, uh, check boxes and whatnot Something we haven't talked about during this, uh, this microconference is the LVM um, Linux project. We actually have a whole build system that downloads and patches and builds and then tests all the moving parts for this because originally we had to patch uh, LLVM, Clang, we had to patch QMU and a few other things all to get this stuff to work together. So we have a big set of make files that does a bunch of git clones, a bunch of patches and runs all the things appropriately in order to get this done. It's not that these things can't be done separately and manually, it was just a whole lot easier to automate these things so that we had consistent tests all the time. So certainly if you guys want to follow what we do to make sure this stuff all works, you absolutely just need to clone our, our, uh, our Git repository. You can just run our, our scripts and, and go from there. But indeed, you can also run them manually if you really want to. It'd be really good if somebody could contribute to Yocto Project to use a real build system to do all that. Okay, well actually we're, we were already in, in contact with people like uh, Bruce Ashfield and a bunch of other guys at Yocto to do this. Um, we, we, all we were trying to do is build the kernel with those, these few tools as far as adding it further to Yocto. In fact, we're already talking to um, Raj and everybody else to get LVM in, uh, to get it added to uh, BitBake and so on and so forth. So that's, that's all work in progress. Of course, it's just there's a series of steps to get that to happen. But yes, we're already having those conversations. Yeah, you can also get, there actually is a pre-built Clang, which is described um, how to do that in, in the help system as well. You don't have to build Clang. We had to for a while. Uh, for the last uh, three months up until this conference, I've only been using the pre-built Clang because, as I said previously, um, LLVM 3.3 actually works for the kernel unpatched. With, for scan build to work, you actually need a slightly newer one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> for scan build, you need the newer one. For Thank building you. it with Clang, that, that, that is fine. Okay. There's, it's, or you can just replace the scan build uh, script. Because yeah. that, that's where, where there was a bug that, that has been fixed upstream. Great. Well, that's super. All right. Other than that, I think we are at the end of our session. Pretty close. Yep. Okay, great. Great, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate all your time. Hope you've all learned a little bit more about what, uh, what LLVM can do and, and why it's a good idea. And, and, uh, I hope, uh, hope you see more of our patches soon on uh, LKML. <laughs>